Hey guys, it's Ryan. Um, this will be the first of a few videos I'm going to do really fast on orthodontic tooth movement. Um, I think it's really helpful to think of orthodontic tooth movement in two uh, big picture terms. Biomechanics, which is how um, the tooth reacts to force. So prolonged pressure against a tooth applied to a tooth in some way causes the bone around that tooth to remodel and then enables the tooth to move in its socket. And the mechanics, which is the actual like physics behind how brackets and wires and things apply forces to teeth. And then again, biomechanics is how the tooth reacts, the biology behind that. So we're going to start talking with biomechanics, and I think it's even more helpful to split this up in three big um, modes of thinking. So you're either thinking in terms of the magnitude of the force applied to a tooth, the type of movement, or how much of the PDL is being loaded at a specific point based on if the tooth is tipping or moving bodily, and the duration of the force applied to the tooth. So we're going to start with magnitude in this video. And it's helpful to think in terms of either light force or heavy force, and there's a certain timeline to follow based on how many grams of force you're applying to a given tooth or a group of teeth. Um, for less than one second, this is kind of like if you're, if you're chewing, if you're talking, just like immediate instantaneous force and you let go. That's where the PDL fluid stays in, stays inside um, within the PDL space. The bone bends, which is actually a normal function if you're picking up something, your arm is bending a little bit, the bones in there, and your jaw bends a little bit as it opens. So that's actually a pretty normal function. And uh, piezoelectric current is, is created. And you can think if you're sitting at your desk or something, if you push down on your desk, those molecules uh, in the desk might move very slightly microscopically and the electrons of those molecules move with it. And so the current is really just those electrons being pushed a certain way, and as soon as you let go, the electrons get um, spring back to their original uh, position. So the piezoelectric current is only active when you're actively moving or pushing on something, whether it be your desk or um, you know an eraser that's visibly bending up and down. So similar with the bone. Um, that's only important for maintenance of bone. It's not actually important in orthodontic tooth movement, um, or so people think. And heavy force is the same deal. So whether it's light force, whether you're talking one gram, whether you're talking 50 kilograms of heavy force, it's um, similar, uh, similar reaction at less than one second. As soon as you reach more than one second, you're talking about a prolonged force. So that's something you're biting down, you're staying biting down, or a bracket and a wire pulling on your teeth, or rubber bands pulling on your teeth, and it's and it's staying um, pulled, it's, it's still applying force. And at that point, the fluid no longer stays in the space, it's expressed out, and the tooth moves in the socket. Um, it's able to move because the fluid that was sort of acting as a shock absorber leaves the space and, and creates an emptiness that the tooth then fills in. And this, we're talking like less, I mean, millimeters, micrometers here, that the tooth moves in the socket. Um, once you reach three to five seconds, that's where you see a difference between light and heavy force. So in light force, the blood vessels are only distorted slightly, they're slightly compressed on the side that, um, in the direction of the force. So the force is pulling right, the PDL fibers and the blood vessels and the cells on the right side of the tooth are feeling this force. There's typically no pain associated with that. As soon as you're talking about heavy force, the blood vessels aren't really, aren't just compressed, they're completely occluded, they're completely shut off, and there's pain, just literal pain from the crushing pressure on the PDL. Once you reach minutes, uh, for light force, the um, blood flow and oxygen levels are altered, um, and you see an increase in prostaglandin, which is associated with inflammation and some aching pain, um, which you might not feel for a couple hours with light force, and um, an increase in rank L, which is um, associated with stimulating osteoclasts. Um, so that's going to be important um, 
for this. And I'll, I'll continue with light force here to talk about this. Prostaglandin E is actually really important to stimulate both osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Um, so it's really um, critical in actually how light force creates orthodontic tooth movement. Once you reach about four hours, that's where you see an increase in cyclic AMP levels in the PDL. And that's um, lined up perfectly with the threshold of tooth movement. And we'll talk more about this in the duration video, but you really need about four to eight hours is the absolute minimum for um, seeing tooth movement. And so that's associated with this cyclic AMP, um, which is also important for cell differentiation. So you start out at the PDL with a bunch of undifferentiated mesenchymal cells that are just kind of hanging out waiting to be told what to do. And once you have pressure and you have prostaglandin and you have cyclic AMP, then they know, oh, it's time to become osteoclast and osteoblasts. And so once you reach about two days, those osteoclast and osteoblasts are functioning in um, a coupling system. They work together um, and cause frontal re uh, resorption. And um, so that's where you're taking away bone from the front of the lamina dura absolutely adjacent to the tooth and the PDL and they just start eating away like Pac-Man at the tooth um, at the at the bone rather so the tooth can begin to move slowly but uh, surely and um, I think there's something else I wanted to say um, for the osteoclast and osteoblast the first wave of them comes from the PDL uh, local area and there's a second larger wave of those cells that are recruited from the blood supply. Um, so I guess that's kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and then for heavy force, we talked about how the blood vessels are completely occluded. Within minutes, the blood flow is completely cut off. And so when there's no blood flows to somewhere, you know, after a few hours, that area is going to start to die or necrose. And it's sterile because it's not associated with a bacteria or virus or whatever. It's just that we cut off blood flow because we put so much pressure of the tooth against the bone and that PDL tissue starts to die. And it's called hyalinized PDL. It's not cartilage, but it kind of looks like it because there are no cells because um, they're all dying. So um, that's that. And now there's a lag period. It doesn't take two days for resorption to begin. It takes actually three to five days. So You'd think with more force it would be faster, but actually it's not. It lags behind a few days. And undermining resorption begins, and that's where bone cells, osteoclasts mainly, are recruited not in the PDL because we killed that. It has to they have to come from the bone marrow within the bone, so on the other side, not the lamina dura, within the um, bone that the tooth is pushing up against. And so that takes longer for those cells to kind of wake up and differentiate and become actual osteoclasts. So it's not it's basically one or two weeks until um, an entire width of the lamina dura is resorbed and the tooth moves kind of jumps forward um, a bit. Um, also important to know is that the PDL takes at least two weeks to repair after this point, after the uh, it's gone sterile necrosis. Um, so that controls how often you do orthodontic activation, how often you call a patient in and change the wire out. So if it takes two weeks to undergo uh, resorption, it takes another two weeks to repair. So you're not seeing that patient for another four to six weeks to put a new wire in. Um, and then once you take braces off, it takes even long, it takes three to four months to completely reorganize the PDL and have those collagen fibers perfectly parallel where they're supposed to be. So that's about a good timeline for how long to wear a retainer to keep your teeth from moving back to their original spot. Um, so gingival fibers take almost a year, so you want to keep retainers on for a long time to let that uh, tissue repair. Um, and then this is just a small graph I drew looking at uh, frontal versus undermining resorption. So this is distance of tooth movement. This is a period of time. And you can see how frontal resorption is slow but steady. It's a steady attack on the outer surface of bone. And undermining resorption, we have that delay until the entire bone adjacent to the tooth can be removed. And then the tooth jumps forward. And then we have to have, we have to wait 
well, we should wait at least two weeks for the PDL to repair before we can um, reactivate and do another round of undermining resorption. So um, frontal and light force is ideal, but it's very hard to avoid um, heavy force. And it's acceptable as long as the force decays to zero after the undermining resorption ends, and then we have time for PDL repair before we put in a new wire. So that's it for magnitude. Stay tuned for next videos about biomechanics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.